Welcome to the Journal Editorial Report. I'm Paul Gigot. First up this week, the Times Square bomber and lessons from the United Kingdom as authorities continue their investigation into the attempted terror attack in New York City. A clearer profile has emerged of the suspect Faisal Shahzad, a Pakistani-born American citizen. Shahzad has spent a decade in the United States obtaining two university degrees and working in Connecticut as a financial analyst. Until last year, he lived in a quiet suburb with his wife and two children. It's a story all too familiar in the United Kingdom, where in 2005, London's transportation system was attacked by four British nationals, three of Pakistani descent. Earlier, I spoke with Melanie Phillips, a columnist for London's Daily Mail and author of the new book, The World Turned Upside Down, The Global Battle Over Truth, God, and Power. I asked her what the U.S. could learn from England's experience with homegrown terror. Well, I think the main lesson the United States can learn from the United Kingdom is to learn from its mistakes. And the main mistake the United Kingdom has made and continues to make is to refuse to accept that what we're all facing in the West is a religious war, an Islamic jihad. It insists, uh, Britain insists on regarding it as um, just violence and terrorism arising from a set of particular grievances around the world. It will not accept its motivated by religious fanaticism. That it has result, that religious root. What, what are the implications of that? What, is, what does mm -hmm. that mean that Britain is not doing, that well, it should be doing, and yeah. uh, by implication we should be doing? Well, as a result, Britain is making the terrible mistake of thinking, uh, amazing as this may seem, that religious fanaticism is a kind of antidote to Islamic terror. An it antidote? Thinks, but an antidote, yes. Really? It thinks, yes. It thinks it can use, for example, the extremists of the Muslim Brotherhood to kind of channel the, quote, idealism uh, of young British Muslim men, classically, who are the people who might be drawn towards Al-Qaeda-style terrorism, and divert them into what the British official mind thinks is relatively harmless religious fanaticism. And that is because it cannot conceive that the religious fanaticism actually feeds in at the extremes Well, that's to what this would seem, logically, to me anyway, to actually feed this kind of fanaticism and make even more people who might be on the margins and, not, and might, be, might be actually happy with British society more susceptible to the kind of alienation of, of jihad. Is that, absolutely. Is that not right? It's absolutely crazy, but this is what's happening. So um, the British authorities, and not just the political authorities, but academic authorities, turn a blind eye, for example, to the radicalization on campus right. by groups such as Hizbut Tahrir, which purport not to be involved in violence in Britain, but nevertheless uh, uh, radicalize young Muslims on campus to the jihad, to the idea that the West should be overturned, that Britain should become an Islamic theocracy. But isn't that very difficult for a secular society to fight back against something like that? Because it means you have to be very, very conscious of religions and mm. religious ideology. When we're taught, live and let live, yes. anything it goes, relative, uh, you know, we're all uh, equal, and, and in, particularly in America, mm. we don't have a state religion. Yes. So, so what do you do as a state mm. to, be, to, to, to try to fight back against that? Well, it's not, in my view, very difficult. Uh, or it shouldn't be very difficult. It is difficult because in the West, in Britain and America, we tell ourselves that uh, religion is a kind of protective space because we are brought up to believe that you have to be tolerant to religious minorities. And that's absolutely correct. You must be tolerant. That is the essence of a free, democratic, liberal society. Sure. But you must accept also that if religion steps over the bounds into politics, into ideology, into the attempt to conquer your own country and your culture, you must resist it. So what we should be doing in Britain, and we're not, we should be holding the line for British, Western, democratic, liberal values. We should be saying that actually our values, we think, are superior. Let's take the case of Nidal Hassan, who was accused of killing the killings at Fort Hood. Uh, he was the, uh, the, 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 the military uh, cleric who was uh, thought to have uh, Islamic radical tendencies. People noticed them, spoke about them, and nothing was done about it. Yes. How would you treat his case uh, given what you've just said? Well, it's very, very similar to what's happening in Britain. Um, it's, it's this terrible and lethal reluctance of the official world to go anywhere near religious political, fanaticism. Political correctness. Um, political correctness. But do you have to drum somebody like that then out of the military? Do you have to be conscious of, of this religious identity and say, look, you can't teach in a mosque, you can't be a teacher in a well, school? Is that what you're talking about? I think a line must be drawn between, as it were, 
um, uh, spiritual religious identity, right. which a liberal society must accommodate, minority spiritual, liberal ident uh, sp spiritual religious identity, and the kind of religious identity which poses a direct threat to our state, our society. Now, if an individual in the military or anywhere else is expressing attitudes, beliefs, which lead us to think that possibly this is a threat, then it must be stopped extremism and, must be stopped. And would that mean, say, with uh, 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 immigrants who have come over from Pakistan mm -hmm. and, and keep traveling back and forth, at some point do you, do you expel them or do you stop, do you ask these people about their religious beliefs before you let them to be citizens? Well, That'd be inimical to the United States First Amendment. I think one should. Um, uh, I think that uh, with so much of the Islamic world having fallen prey to this very militarized, radicalized, threatening uh, set of beliefs. Um, I think one should do that. It's very important to bear in mind that a very large number of Muslims in Britain and everywhere else are not radical. Right. They wish to live just like you and me, raise their children, have a good job, benefit from the human rights of the West. It's very important that we don't forget that. We must not demonize all Muslims, but at the same time, we mustn't be stupid about it as we are being and say, because we don't want to demonize all Muslims, we're not going to ask anybody about their radical beliefs. We have got to learn to differentiate between uh, the religious beliefs that are right and proper, that a liberal society should tolerate and accept and welcome, and the religious, in quotes, beliefs that are actually right. militaristic and threatening and subversive, which should not be tolerated. All right. Thank you, Melanie Phillips. Thanks for being here. Not at all. Thank you.